Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. And today we're heading into the German section, currently called High Seas Fleet but I'll probably have to relabel that. And we're going to add photos, so we're going to be editing and adding a section which is a bit new for what we've done with the galleries before. So gone to add section, we've chosen our standard gallery, remove the stock pictures which is the first stage in all cases and then head in to upload some new photos. So as we wait for them to upload, we realize we have a four width grid up on the current display section. So we'll probably want to replicate that. So go into section um, and we're going to make sure that we have the format, but there we go. Now it's not exactly like the gallery slightly further up. I'm just changing the aspect ratios around for the display pictures, which you can do. But uh, you can see these photos have a slightly different spacing. You see the spacing there is 35, the default spacing is 50. So we're going to change that to 35. That matches a bit better. Do a little bit of playing around later on as well. And that's it. We're pretty much done. It is literally that easy. Um, also, you'll notice if you do open a photo in a new tab, the file name tells you what the ship is and where possible what date that photo was taken. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for oh, maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakenfell. You can get a free trial. And once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video and on with the main show. Hello, everybody. Today we're going to take a look at a couple more artifacts from U534. You might remember some of the videos from earlier in the year when we had a look at some of the other artifacts and had a quick tour around what the U-boat was in at the time in terms of what state it was in. But this is something that's come directly from the U-boat. As you can tell, it was in a relatively good state of preservation and it's been mounted on this portable display unit so that it can be shown to people. And I currently happen to have it are on loan from the U-boat. Now, what exactly is it? No, it's not the fabled TV signal co collection and detection device that the BBC ostensibly used to work out if you've paid your TV license or not, despite what it says on the front. That is actually the manufacturer's mark. And no, the BBC wasn't supplying U-boat control devices to Germany either. That is actually the mark of a company called Brown, Bovry und See, I think. Um, German speakers, please feel free to correct me in the comments because of course we are going to be using a lot of German terms because it is a U-boat artifact and my high school German only goes so far. Anyway, the firm is Swiss, but no, that also doesn't mean the Swiss were supplying the Germans with U-boat control components. In fact, the company had multiple subsidiaries that were semi-independent all across Europe. So it's much more likely that this was manufactured by the German subsidiary of the company and the company as a whole works mostly in electrical engineering and some other heavy machinery as well, which would make sense given what this is. Now, there is some hints I've already mentioned. It's some kind of control unit. And for those of you who follow my occasionally updated Twitter account, you'll have seen a uh, little spoiler preview of this because of course there are a couple of other things that you can see about this. Firstly, you can see there are two labels just up here, BB and STB. Now, one of those might be relatively easy to determine. The STB means starboard. Well, in English it means starboard. In German it means Steuerboard or Steerboard, I think. Again, please feel free to correct the pronunciation in the comments, but the way it's written, I think, maybe Steuerboard. Um, and well, by process of elimination, the one on the left must mean port, but in German, um, which is backboard. Uh, now, ostensibly, backboard and Steuerboard, well, they pretty much have exactly the same roots as English port and starboard. The steerboard or, or starboard or Steuerboard is the right-hand side because that is where the old steering oar would be. Now, in English, we derived port for the left-hand side eventually, although it was larboard for a very long time, because it basically comes down to if your steering oar is on the right, you don't want to smash it up against the dock side, so you dock on the other side. So that would be your, the side that is your port side. Um, for a further discussion of the etymology of larboard and port, we can look at that in another video. In any case, 
ostensibly in German practice, if you were steering your ship with the steering oar on the right, you would be standing at a 90 degree angle to the direction of travel, which would mean your back would be to port, hence I guess backboard. Um, that's what I've found. If there's any other discussion as to where exactly the terms originate, again, let us know in the comments below. But uh, much as uh, port and starboard have plenty of discussion still going on in English, I'm fairly sure there may be some other different ideas in German, nonetheless. Now all of that might have given you some kind of clue that this is in fact effectively the U-boat equivalent of a ship's wheel. Well, why isn't it wheel-shaped? Uh, well, for one thing, if you've ever been inside a U-boat's control position or any submarine's control position, they're quite cramped. So having a wheel is going to be somewhat impractical unless it's one of those dinky little ones you get on a little riverboat. Uh, secondly, submarines, of course, move in three dimensions, well, as do ships, but submarines tend to move through three dimensions considerably more than ships do because submarines ascend and descend by design. And so for practical reasons in terms of size and also in terms of that, that movement, it's much, much easier to have something like this because, of course, you're not going to have a mechanical linkage to the rudder. You know, if you did have a mechanical linkage to the rudder, that would be another very, very easy way for water to get in. And I'm not entirely sure how you would seal it, to be perfectly honest, um, as in you know, cables and so forth. But this is an electrical control unit. You probably can't quite see because it's in shadow, but down at the bottom, there's a bolt which is covering um, a panel, which is where cabling could be accessed. But obviously the main control cabling goes in the back, which is currently mounted to, hilariously enough, a backboard. Um, now, these handles are here basically just to allow somebody to hold on to the thing, because as we said, submarines move in three dimensions. So if the submarine is violently pitching, either because it's doing an emergency ascent, an emergency descent, or it's going all over the place because it's being depth charged, you don't want someone who's trying to navigate your U-boat from being thrown away from their steering position. So you can hold on to both of those. And then if you want to steer the submarine to port or starboard, then you would depress the relevant plunger. And, you know, for something that was on the seabed for more than half a century, you may be surprised to know that this one still works. You see, if I press the starboard one down, then the port one goes up and then it will gradually return to position. And if I do the same and press the port one down, the starboard one comes up. So if this was still attached to U534 and U534 was still in one piece and operational, then this would allow me to steer the submarine to the left or to the right. So at some point when I'm back up at the submarine museum, I might even be able to persuade them to let me open this up. Obviously, I'm not just going to do that of my own initiative because this is, after all, an original piece and still functioning but we might be able to then see exactly what's inside and how that works. So let us know again if you'd like to see that in the future. Now, this is the other thing we're going to look at today. This is a little bit of a box of mystery. Now, obviously this also came out of the U-boat. You can actually see down here where it's rusted somewhat, obviously from sitting on the bottom of the ocean. But unfortunately, whilst a lot of paper artifacts survive, this one, quite clearly, as you can see from some of the outlines, had some kind of labelling on the top. I mean, these bolt holes probably had something else on it as well. Um, but there was clearly some kind of uh, A4 paper label on here that told you what it was and what it did that has disintegrated over time. So when we had a look at this first, so let's open it up without breaking the precious artifact. It was something of a mystery as to what exactly were we looking at. Um, and I must admit, it stumped me for a good long while. I mean, you can see, if I just move those, you've got these rather wonderful spanners. And as you can see, they ha show plenty of signs of long-term water immersion, um, but still in the original locations. And this one as well. But the fact they're coming to in vanadium probably <laughs> explains why they're still around. Now, from my engineering training, bearing in mind I checked, trained as a civil engineer first and uh, with some, let's just say, uh, adopting some lectures and stuff from other engineering disciplines, um, 
it was immediately apparent to me that these things were some kind of resistor or uh, some kind of switch that changed the resistance of things. Now, obviously one of them is in slightly worse condition than the other, but I do have permission to actually look at these. So we can see this one. And as you can see, these, are, these discs are an insulating material and these are wired up, but can clearly very easily be rewired in different positions. And this you can actually turn. You could hit, probably hear that it still actually clicks in position as, there you go, as it reaches different um, lock points. It was remarkably pre well preserved actually. Now that's obviously therefore some kind of testing or control unit. Then we have these things. Now these are a little bit more delicate. These are ceramic discs. I We strongly suspect that these are basically the same as these ones, except that these are spares and these ones have obviously been stained by the iron that's corroded, or the steel, I guess, that's corroded around them. Whereas these ones that were over here have not. And these do actually come apart into separate discs, but trust me, putting them back together is a bit of a pig. Um, and they've got this, which corresponds to one of these, or possibly there's also uh, on, the ba on the base there. So these are obviously spare insulating discs. We also have these, these are obviously ceramic uh, insulators with uh, lines for wiring. There's a whole load of those. So there's that ones in those size and there's these slightly larger ones. So it's obviously a spare parts kit of some description. We've got this, which um, is another kind of, as you can see, insulator. Um, and that whole thing very carefully lifts out and we have even more spare parts we've got some more pitted giant allen key sets well reverse allen key set i guess at that point um, and some other nice big ceramic insulation blocks and then the single biggest item is this which <laughs> for all the world looks like a boiler heating unit and it has some uh, inscriptions on it so it says uh, WS2K40-20872 and there's some markings on there 220 volt 4KW so 220 volts and 4 kilowatts um, and there's a few more bits of tooling in here so there's one of the rods for those reverse allen key wrenches and so forth put that back in and I'll pop that back down as well. Now you might be wondering therefore what on earth could this be <laughs> because uh, I must admit it had us stumped. When I was looking at it initially I thought it might be something to do with the torpedoes because it was found in the forward torpedo room as far as I'm aware um, and they had electric torpedoes aboard, they had the Zalkernig 2 torpedoes aboard, and some fuels do need preheating, to some, to especially um, uh, battery powered torpedoes also sometimes need preheating and it can be quite cold down there. So my initial thoughts were maybe it's something to do with checking, testing, and maybe even heating up torpedoes before they are launched. But uh, I wasn't sure. So I thought I would ask some people who might know better, and I did. <laughs> and as a result, I was um, very kindly assisted by a chap named Peter. So shout out if you're watching this video. Thank you very much for your help in researching this. And it turns out that obviously U-534 is not the only Type 9 U-boat that has been gone over with a fine tooth comb. In fact, obviously U-505, which exists in America, actually has been gone over with an even finer tooth comb because of course they captured that one intact whereas U-534 as you can tell um, was taken up from the seabed and he managed to locate something rather interesting with relation to the water distillation unit aboard a Type 9. Now water distillation that if it's some kind of water-based thing that would immediately explain that heating coil that looks very much like a um, you know a boiler heating coil because well, to distill water. <laughs> One of the things you need is a way of regulating 
the temperature in it. And the report mentions the heating coils, well, there you go, installed provide a wide range of heat input to the distiller. The six individual coils have the necessary switching arrangements so that by proper parallel or series setups, heat inputs can be varied in steps of 0.17 kilowatts to 3.36 kilowatts at 110 volts or 0.4 kilowatts to 8 kilowatts at 170 volts. As a result of the comparatively high heat input possible for such a small unit, initial heating of the feed water can be accelerated, and during steady operation only one coil is required to provide the necessary heat. So, there we go. This is almost certainly what we're looking at. This is a spare parts dash repairs kit for the water distillation unit aboard U534. Quite what it was doing in the <laughs> forward torpedo compartment, not entirely sure, but given the fact that the thing sank um, and you don't necessarily have to store all the spare part kits right next to their relevant bits of equipment, it's entirely possible it either was stored there generically or maybe it floated there or was knocked there during the process of the ship's sinking. Now, one of the other interesting things to note about the water distillation unit is it's not just there to provide drinking water for the crew, it's also there to provide pure distilled water for the batteries. Because, of course, although it's a diesel electric submarine, there is the electric component of that, and the distilled water that's needed for the batteries would occasionally need to be topped up. So there we go, as we close up the box of mysteries, again, once I go back to U534, we can ask them about potentially taking apart one of these two to see how it works inside. But once again, these being very old artifacts, don't want to do that without direct permission and, and under supervision. But hopefully those have been interesting as you get to see just, well, in a slightly rustic condition, what kind of things you might find aboard a German U-boat back in World War II. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.